Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kicking It, a new interview series where we kick it with players, coaches, and staff to give fans new insights into the Richmond Kickers. My name is Nathan Heinchel, manager of digital content for the Richmond Kickers, and I'm pleased to kick off the series with an exciting first guest. Live from California, where he's safely riding out the COVID-19 pandemic, is our newest signing, Zev Talbleev. Zev, welcome to the Kickers family. How's it going today? It's going well. Thanks for having me. It's uh, exciting to be on during these hectic times, but uh, I'm really happy to be here. Excellent. Um, so we want to get into it. Uh, this is going to be kind of a short get to know you series. Everybody can read the press release as far as finding out the nuts and bolts of your career, but we'd like to kind of give everybody some insights into our newest signing. Um, but we will get a little bit into your career just to start off. You most recently played in Sweden uh, with Ovita Beg. You know, what was that experience like? I know you told me in a pre-interview that, you know, it was Very your dream good. to play soccer abroad. So what was that like? you know, finally getting to do that in Sweden? Uh, it was really special. Uh, initially, I played with a team called Varberg. That was the first team I played for in Sweden. And I had been playing in the USL. And I would say, if you ask most of us players, we want to play in Europe or as close to Europe as we can get. And when the opportunity arose, honestly, at first, I was a bit skeptical. And then I went over there. And the first team I signed with was a smaller team, but playing, you know, at a high level. And it was a really exciting process. And then the last team I played for has a huge history. In the 70s, they played against Barcelona. Actually, Brazil's national team would come play there in the offseason. And there's pictures of Pelé around the stadium because in the 60s, that club had a connection with a Brazilian calculator company. And they, that's how they got their big players. And so there's this massive history, and it's in a beautiful stadium that you know really makes you feel like you're playing at the – highest level there is and it's just so it was you know it felt very much like what most of us dreamed of playing for the Chelsea's and the United's and you know, the Liverpool's that's or the Arsenal's don't want to leave anyone out but it was like I felt like I was there and then you know upon the facilities and things like that and then also you have the fans where you know I love the fans here and they're because it's their sport it's their favorite sport it's kind of what they live live for day in and day out it was really, really special. So I had a great time there, and uh, it, was, it was really good for me as a, somebody who dreamt of playing abroad. I got to not only smell it, I got to taste it. Yeah, and that wasn't the first time that you had experience playing abroad uh, because you also had a chance to kind of work in the Fulham and the Tottenham Academies too as a youth, right? When I was young there, and we may touch on this, but when I was young, I was – quite short I'm not so much taller now luckily you can't tell on camera but I'm <laughs> five six and so when I was growing up I was quite short and no no teams would sign me there was no teams in my area that would say yes to me and I started training with this gentleman named Dan Metcalf who uh, is famous in the California area for having produced quite a few really good youth teams and I was training with him and he had this team that was U18 and I was 14 and I told him, look, nobody will let me play for them. They keep saying I'm too small. And he said, why don't you come play for us? So at 14, I was playing U18 with all these guys who, many of whom have since gone to play in the USL. Some, one of them plays for the Galaxy now. And all, most of whom went to play Division One soccer. And, you know, I was playing all, with all these guys. And I remember one game, you know, there was a substitution. And I was going on in the last couple minutes. And the captain gave me the armband and it didn't fit around my arm. And... That year, they decided they had won Dallas Cup, which is a big youth tournament, and they're not going to do that again. We're going to go play below and West Ham in with the youth teams there, and I impressed Fulham when I was there, and then I kept going back from when I was 14 to 18 every summer, and that was a huge stepping stone for me because even having gone there when I would come back, it wasn't like teams were biting it, and what struck me was their – curriculum you know it really one day my dad out there playing quote or that conversation I was like that is so true I need to be doing something and when I went to Fulham you know they train Monday through Sunday twice a day they'll have a couple off days in between there they lift they play they go to school in the morning they get breakfast then they study football then they study the physical then they go play then they go lift and I just it struck me to the core so when I came home after those trips I tried my best to replicate those schedules so then I could achieve my dream of playing, you know, as much as possible at the highest level, which inevitably meant becoming a pro. 
Awesome. Yeah. It, it, a couple of soccer players that I've had the privilege of interviewing that when they've had those experiences to train outside the United States, it, it, they always seem to come back as better players. You know, we had Joe Gallardo last year for the kickers who got to come up in the Monterey Academy, uh, the, the famous Mexican club. And he said that it was night and day leaving the States and going to train in a system that, you know, lives and breathes football. And it isn't, you know, hey, we hope you play well enough so that way you can get a college scholarship. It's like, no, we're planning on developing you so that way you can play first team football. Um, and it, it's impressive how it changes that mindset for anybody who has the, the opportunity to go do that and how it, you know, helps improve you as a player then too. Yeah, but it's one of the reasons why I really like Darren is because Darren has it at that level, the way he sets his sessions. And I know I'm probably jumping ahead here, but I knew Darren a bit before I signed with Richmond. and you know, he, he had it at the level that they have it abroad. And that, of course, I knew that because I had been abroad. So that was very appealing to me when, you know, we got back in touch. Yeah, so um, <laughs> we'll, we'll hot play technique that one. We'll come back to it in just a second. Um, so it, going back to your experiences in Sweden, so you're at this point, you're living your dream, uh, playing soccer abroad. Uh, I think you had just signed a contract, what, a couple months ago, a, a new contract, uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic began to spread, um, which obviously had to be a very difficult decision uh, because you decided to cut your dream short and come back to the States to be closer to family. Um, what, is it, what was that decision-making process like when you realized that you were going to have to leave Sweden uh, to make all of this work? Well, first I would say, I wouldn't say it was leaving my dream in the sense that, you know, my dream is to be able to play at the highest level with the best group of guys possible. But I, I do understand what you mean in regards to it was Europe, it was closer. And because of the ep epidemic or pandemic, you, you know, I had to maybe leave sooner than I would have. Not to say one day I don't go back. But I would say, you know, it was, it could have been more difficult, say, if, there were other circumstances, say I got injured or I don't know, maybe I fell out with the club for some reason, but you know, this was, I'm, you know, this is a, a natural, not a, I guess you could say a natural disaster, but you know, this was an extreme event where, you know, life was, you know, at risk for some people, you know, maybe people in my family who are at risk or, you know, people in your community. So the, the decision, you know, was clear in the sense that life is more important than soccer. Uh, I think, I would add that I'm quite fortunate in that given how late it was in both the, the European schedule, which Sweden is very similar to, to the USL, but that, you know, there was still an opportunity with Darren because we had had conversations before in the past and years prior even, and, you know, it was late. And given the fact that I had to leave, become fortunate to say that my dream gets to continue. Uh, because I would say partly because I worked hard, but also because of the, the fortunes of time that I was able to connect with Darren in a place where he was looking for someone like me and that we could come to an arrangement because now I get to keep playing. And as I think we'll probably talk about also, I've played against Richmond on a number of occasions. And one of the things that always struck me was you had a fantastic field, which I was incredibly envious of. And your fans in that far corner we're always so enthusiastic. I think there was a goal that Callahan scored against us, a banger. And I just remember them erupting. And I played for Wilmington at the time. And our field was, you know, a nightmare. And then it was a dream to come to you guys. So I would say that far from my dream ending, I would say that not only is it continue, I would say it's taken a step forward. And so I'm really grateful that, you know, I've been able to move in this direction. Yeah, and certainly I don't mean to make it sound like the soccer dream itself was over. Um, it's just one of those things where it, it feels like <laughs> a lot of American players, that there's only so many opportunities we seem to have to get over to, you know, Europe or play abroad. And so it, I'm sure it was a difficult decision to, you know, put it on hold at least once, you know, now that you finally had reached that point to kind of say, hey, we got to pump the brakes here and, uh, go back home and make sure everything's all right. Um, it's a sacrifice I'm sure a lot of people have had to make. And, uh, you know, it's it's just the times that we're in right now. Um, but we, we kind of touched on it. Uh, yeah. you, you did have a previous relationship with coach uh, Darren Sawatsky, for those who don't know, our sporting director and head coach. 
Um, you had previously worked with them at the Seattle Sounders uh, PDL Academy, correct? I did. And that was a, I would qualify as a great story in the sense that that year, so I've been playing Division One college soccer at Valparaiso. And we were, you know, big school in regards to the last, you know, maybe the year prior we won this as, you know, the Stanford's or UCLA's or our BCU's even. But we had done really well starting my freshman year. We had been ranked top 25. And my goal was to go pro. And I thought when you want an internship and you want to work for Google, the best thing to do is to get an internship at Google. So I thought, well, I want to play in the MLS. I should be playing for an MLS you know, academy or PDL team. So I searched all I could find. And to be honest, I don't recall. I think I had gone to a couple of other ones. I think I went to Portland. They were on the West Coast because I was living in California. And I might have spoken to New York because I have family there. And I remember the Sounders had an open tryout. There was 100 kids or so. And I remember because, and there's a photo of it, I wore a pink shirt because I wanted to stick out as much as possible. I wore short white socks because everybody always wore long socks. And I wanted, and they, they're actually like skateboard socks. They're Quicksilver brand. And I remember it's very clearly because it's in the picture because I look kind of ridiculous when I'm shaking hands with Darren because I'm wearing skateboard socks and this pink, bright pink men's soccer jersey. And my whole concept was there's a hot here and, you know, standard five. So I played my heart out. Uh, I can't say I remember the tryout all that well, but I do remember Darren saying, that he wants me to be part of the team. I remember that quite clearly. So then that spawned uh, the move to Puyallup, uh, Seattle, or Puyallup, Washington. And never, I had more. And it was, you know, it was amazing. And there were some really good players on that team. Nico Hansen plays for the crew. Um, there's a couple other players that I've gone on to play in the USL. One of them is escaping my name now. He plays for New Mexico as a winger. He, played, he got drafted to San Jose for a bit. They both went to University of New Mexico. The name comes back to you all say it. But anyways, you know, it was, a, it was a huge stepping stone for me because I was playing with guys who I knew were going to get drafted. Jordan Morris was there. And, you know, that was obviously he was, uh, I think, about to be called up to the national team a year or two later. So it was really, for me, it was kind of my first sense having been in the United States where I was touching the professional ranks. And Darren, you know, I'm here to win. This is our job. We're here to develop you as people also. But you know, my, our job is to win. This is, we got to put food on the table for our family. And that, you know, really struck a chord with me. And Darren was great with me because frankly, at the very beginning, I wasn't part of the starting group. And then as time went on and I trained after and he would stay with me and he would answer my long winded questions, you know, I became a focal point and I had a really good season. And that was, you know, kind of jump started me to believe that, you know, I can play professionally. Uh, of all the uh, MLS academies, it seems like, and PDL systems, one of the best ones to come out of would be Seattle, considering the the talent factory that that area has really become, uh, especially when you look at some of the people that are on the national team and uh, former legends of the national team. Uh, Jordan Morris is a great example. Um, current MLS champion Jordan Morris will put some respect on his name. So um, that, must, that must have been really, really important, too, as you're – uh, still playing college to have that, you know, that little bit of taste of working in a professional environment in the U.S. then too, after you've had the European experience to kind of continue developing. Um, was there anything as far as when you were on those PDL teams to, that helped you that you brought back to Valparaiso during your college career? Oh, 100%. I mean, the biggest one was at Valpo, we were, you know, kind of like it was David and Goliath. We would go, you know, we were in a big conference playing against big schools, Michigan, Michigan State, but we were, you know, the underdog. And when I was playing at Seattle, I was playing with players that were of the Michigan State, you know, top Big Ten caliber level. And when I was playing with them, I go, look, they're good players, but I'm a good player and I can play with them, against them. And so when I went back to Valpo, I was like, I think that my confidence when we played against those teams and I would say it to my teammates as I was the captain junior or senior year I would say look guys I've played with these guys they're not you know we are of that level they're they're a high level for sure but we are of that level as well and that enabled us to play you know we had really our record against those teams were quite good and if all of us so for sure that's a great question I definitely 
you know, brought a ton back to that. Uh, and also, having coached by Darren, you know, all of us wanted to play pro. So it was like I could tell them, look, I just was with Jordan Morris and Nico Hans. These guys are going to get drafted. You know, if you compare me yourself to me and I compare myself to them in a sense, not trying to be them, but just the level, then you can have a lot of confidence in yourself. And I think that helped our team do well as, you know, I finished out my college career. Absolutely. And uh, another thing that we've kind of touched on a little bit, um, and I would like to give our fans a little bit more insight into, you know, you as a person. Um, it, it certainly seems like you've got the, you know, the drive to continuously improve yourself. And I don't want to say necessarily that you work to prove the doubters wrong, but of course you were told during your development as a soccer player um, with your listed height of five foot six, that you were too short and it was going to be very difficult for you to advance past, you know, the high school, the college, even into the professional ranks. Um, but now that you have played for Valpo, you have played for various USL teams and MLS academies playing over in Europe, you know, what have you, how have you turned what some might assume as a disadvantage into a strength for yourself? It seems cliche. Well, it is a cliche to say like, <laughs> oh, I was told no and that made me stronger. I mean, that's the truth that I was told no and that made me stronger. But really what the difference is, is I feel quite strong about this as I, you know, mentor some kids that I have that I do through this this mentoring program I started is I go look I am I have the skills that I have if you say to me okay Zeb you need to become as strong as Wahab and you need to be like that type of characteristics in terms of athletic ability that is not me I will waste my time because he's already x amount of steps ahead of me we have totally different attributes instead how can I go I admire and I'm so happy that there are players like Wahab because my role has to be different. I have to go, look, I need to work on my speed and my strength too, but am I going to go, I want to go head to head with Wahab in a tackle 10 out of 10, nine out of 10 times, he's probably going to have an advantage. So how can I go instead? And that's what the beauty of soccer, in my opinion, can go, well, I'm really well, I'm also good at these things, but I would add, so how do I use my movement as opposed to pure strength? to beat an opponent or to make a pass or to help the team in that capacity. So really what it's done, and I think this is just true for anybody who has any weakness of any kind, even if your left foot is weaker or if you're not as fast or if you're really fast, is how do you use your disadvantages or advantages to help you determine what you're going to work on? And I can say in my case, I don't really go practice headers off of corners as often as I practice, say, a volley from outside the box. Because more than likely, that's going to be my role. And obviously, there are some players that come to mind. You didn't see – there was a couple opportunities where Paul Scholes might have headed it in. But for the most part, he's, you know, pinging balls from deep or, you know, making his tackles. But he's, he's using his advantages. So really, what being short did was it meets the reality of how do I develop given my attributes. And that was really helpful because it made me go – well, I need to be amazing on the ball. I need to have every touch of my needs to be, you know, great. I need to understand the game because there are longer. So I need to read the game better. And that's really what it did for me. And, you know, I can't help myself. I guess if you're listening, I would say that's something I would encourage you to do is go, what is it, what are my strengths and what are my weaknesses and how do I create a strategy or a schedule, a, a way of training to, enable myself to have an advantage over those players. And at the same time, like I said before, I'm really grateful there are players that are like Wahab and Connor and players who I'm getting to know on the team because they have attributes that I don't have and I want them to use them so we can win. Yeah, absolutely. And having that confidence and knowing what your abilities are and bringing something to the different to the table too, I, I think it helps just make a team more dangerous because it's less predictable. I mean, if you just have 11 guys who are super strong – then you're going to go up against, you know, another team that's just 11 guys of really quick, speedy guys that can get around the big guys. And so uh, being that much more dangerous because you have all the different talents that, you know, we're going to put on the soccer field this year, I think is really special. And, of course, you know, it, you're a man after my own heart with the Paul Scholes reference. Um, our Liverpool supporting head coach, Darren Sawatsky, would be lucky to have a Paul Scholes on his team. So I think uh, I think if you can bring what 18 brought to the field uh, for uh, all those Premier League titles that Liverpool doesn't have, then uh, I think we're we're much better off with that. Um, so 
touching back on the relationship with coach, uh, when you returned to the United States from Sweden, uh, you were able to ring him up because you guys had that relationship. Um, kind of walk me through what the process has been like as far as getting connected with the kickers. And then since joining the team, what's it been like, you know, trying to bond with your teammates? The, the locker room is such a hollowed ground in sports and you guys haven't had that or you haven't gotten to have that experience with the guys yet. They, you know, have had some training sessions together in the preseason, but, you know, your interactions have all been through Zoom calls and Google Hangouts. So what's that been like trying to get to know your teammates? Yeah. Um, well, to touch on a question with Darren, it was quite fortunate in that as things started to develop in Europe, I had, had the fortunate wisdom of my family to start thinking about, you know, what if you would have to the option. And the club, I don't know if you've read, but in Sweden, they have taken a completely separate approach to how the rest of the world is taking the virus. They are fully open and fully operational. They're training 11. So from their perspective, they were like, you know, we can, we plan to keep going, but as I saw it developing, it since changed and become quite restrictive, but I thought, you know, I'm concerned for my family's well-being and for my well-being. And I thought, you know, I should look because I, of course, want to keep playing soccer. So I sent Darren a note and Darren said, there's, you know, there's definitely interest. We need to stay in touch. And then as things developed very quickly in regards to the virus, it was, you know, here's a situation coach. What, what can we make happen? And he's like, okay, well, let's, here's, the, here's the deal. Um, does this work? I say this works. And then I was fortunate to say yes to that. And then in regards to getting to know the players, luckily I have a, a couple relationships with a few of them from prior teams, or I wouldn't even say prior teams, just soccer is a small world. We met somewhere along the, the tryout path or the playing path. Luca, I know a little bit. Um, Lee and I, he played in Sweden. We didn't meet while he was there, but we've been able to practice our Swedish together. So that's been really fun. And of course, Mika, the assistant coach, he's Finnish. And in Finland, they all have to speak Swedish or learn Swedish. And then on top of that, Victor is Swedish. So ironically, you know, there's four of us speaking Swedish. And it's hilarious because, like, my Swedish is, is very basic. And Lee's Swedish is much better than mine. But also perhaps not expert level. And then Victor's, of course, is perfect. And Mika's is perfect. So it's funny to think you could have, you know, a locker room, everyone speaking Spanish or English, and then you have four, three of which aren't even Swedish, speaking Swedish in the locker room for fun. I mean, we don't say anything that, I don't say anything that much because I don't know the, the language perfectly. But that's been really cool, actually, as in terms of a bonding method, to be able to relate on that capacity and make inside jokes. And I'm really looking forward to getting to know the rest of the guys. Akira has been putting us through some fantastic yoga sessions. And that's also been really good. And I oddly, I was saying, we did it this morning. I was saying to myself, there's something about the conscious knowing that we're all doing breaths together that is very uniting. It sounds a little wooey or corny, I guess. I, I was not something I, if you told me, would you have your team do that? I'd be like, that's kind of weird. But it's been really great. It's been amazing, actually knowing that we're all doing not only exercise together, but we're trying to sync our breath. I think it's a cool concept in terms of, you know, getting to know each other at a truly another level. That's one of those things, like you say, it, it, it almost feels corny to say it, but it's still very uniting in the fact that, I mean, on a soccer field, when you're running these formations, you guys all have to be in sync with each other to make the play work. And so just having that, you know, very, very like base level of it being in sync, I think is going to really help you guys out and, it's a unique way to kind of first start bonding with your teammates, but I, uh, I didn't know we had so many Swedish speakers on our team. I think that's, that's pretty funny. It um, reminds me of like when I was working at Penn FC, we had a, a Brazilian player who had played abroad and our German coach would speak to him in German uh, just to mess with everybody else. And um, cause he spoke pretty good English and obviously his Portuguese was amazing, but his German was really, really strong. And uh, I speak it just barely, so I pick up on a couple of things they'd say, and it was always pretty funny. Um, but it, that's what's so cool about the it sport, is cool. too, is all the different people that get brought together. And you, you wouldn't necessarily know anything, of, you know, you wouldn't necessarily know that Lee Johnson speaks, you know, Swedish. But then, oh, wow, you know, he's got this hidden talent that you didn't know. Exactly. And that's kind of the purpose of this series is we want to let people know about our players. Exactly, hidden talents. yeah, that's true. Um, so does that mean, are, are you, because I saw you mentioned something about music in your, in your piece uh, that you had sent to me previously. Um, does that mean you and Victor Falk are going to throw some DJ parties once uh, quarantine's lifted? 
but I have really started to like there's some Swedish artists and now I don't really practice I need to practice my Swedish more often and I don't but I enjoy the music so that kind of enables me to hear it from time to time and when you're a I mean this is true in soccer locker rooms because there's so many different backgrounds that there's somebody who's played abroad or is from abroad so the locker room always has very different music I would say than probably compared to a traditional American football or baseball locker room be my guess although I've never been in one of those is when you go abroad but it's just American music more than any other music. But then you get the you get the French here, the German there, and that's fun. I think that's like the fun the mo- one of the most fun parts of when you get to travel abroad too is just immersing yourself in something that you're not used to. I think um, some see being a fish out of water as scary, and others I think really kind of gravitate towards it and really thrive in it. And I that was my experience when I was traveling through Europe, I loved um, having to learn French on the fly when I was in Nancy or, you know, having to really, really fine tune my very rusty German when I was in Munich and Berlin. So I think um, that's always- Did you go to any games? Yeah. So I got to go to uh, the Bayern Munich stadium. I didn't get to see a game. We uh, got priced out of tickets for, they they were playing PSV Eindhoven uh, in the Champions League that night, but we just couldn't swing the cost. Uh, we ended up uh, going to a game though in the Olympia Stadium. We saw Hertha Berlin play FC Köln, and um, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. It was life changing. It's the best soccer game I've ever been to, outside of a Richmond Kickers game. Um, I mean, wow, it, it was, why is that? It was just unbelievable. I've never seen anything like that. I've never been to any kind of American sporting event that had that kind of energy, except for maybe a VCU basketball game. I know I'm showing my bias a little bit, as you can see my. VCU degree mm-hmm. in the background, but there's just something, um, the organized chaos that you see from the fan supporter group and the, the drums and the noise. And you look over into the corner and you see the 7,000 FC Cone fans who are, have completely packed the away end. Like you can't fit anybody else in that section. They're all, you know, they've got all the security around them, making sure that nothing pops off. And they are just as loud as like the 20,000, um, Hertha Berlin supporters that sit behind the goal too. I mean, it was, it was an unbelievable experience. And of course you've got the, all the historical elements of that stadium too. Jesse Owens ran on that track. And so all in all, it was just really special. It was a heck of a way to see your first European game, but. Uh, that was very cool. Yeah. And I, I'm sure some of the grounds that you got to play at in Sweden too, were just as electric because there's just something about the way people gravitate towards the sport across the pond. It's just so special. It's true. You're right. It's spot on. It's ironic because Swedish culture is very low key, relaxed. But when they go to a football game, they are very aggressive. Yeah. Um, and one last little question as we continue to get to know you, and uh, we don't want to have this run too long here, but I noticed that in the questionnaire that I gave you uh, for the pre interview, movies and movie making have been a pretty big part of your life. Um, so I'm kind of curious, you know, what have you been watching during quarantine? And uh, I'm curious, what are some of the uh, feature length films that you view as, you know, like comfort food, you know, the movies that you could watch over and over if you were locked away in a room with, you know, X amount of DVDs, like what are the ones that you're going to want to uh, watch? You're correct in the sense it's been a part of my family's life. Uh, um, my parents make films. And so last night, for example, we were talking about this angle and that angle and this lighting and why they took a camera shot from here. I don't claim to be an expert in any capacity, but getting to see them and, you know, they're, they're very good at what they do. They've won two Emmys and, or four Emmys actually, um, is they, you know, they have made their long form sports documentary filmmakers and they've also made some feature films. The Vow for any ladies listening is one of the ones that they made. And um, to answer your other question in regards to for me, I mean, obviously, I'm biased. I like their films or our films. Uh, some of them I got to play some small role in, whether it was get coffee for somebody or, you know, help an interview process or something like that. So those are special to me. Uh, one of which is called Unchained, which is about the un- crazy flips and backflips. And my father was at the start of that with games. And then the other one is called, called The Untold old study told i won't ruin the ending but basically uh goes to save people's lives uh during a maelstrom and crazy things occur after that so but 
in addition to being biased to my family's movie. I really like The Big Short. I think The Big Short is, uh, I know it doesn't sound like comfort food movie, but I just think it's really well done. It's got super great stars. It's both educational, super entertaining, and helped me understand kind of what happened in 2008 in a fun, entertaining way. Spotlight was like a, a great, I think at that year, it won um, the Academy Award of Movie of the Year. And that's yep. a heavy story, but that was great. Um, and then with my brothers, you know, which is kind of our, our funny, our, maybe perhaps our favorite movie is Dumb and Dumber, which it doesn't really get any dumber than that. But that's something we watched when we were kids and we howled laughing like everyone else. And uh, yeah, that's where I would say my movie buff was coming. Awesome. Yeah, I, um, the three movie choices at the end, I, I've seen all of them. I, uh, they're great. Obviously, I mean, you can't go wrong with Dumb and Dumber. At the end of the day, mm -hmm. like, I, I, I like the juxtaposition. You had two really heady movies, and then you had Dumb and Dumber. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it shows that you have range. Um, yeah, that's true. But with that, I think we'll close this off. Um, keeping with the film element, you know, I, I think Coach has put together quite the roster, and I know we're looking forward to putting together a lot of highlights on the field. So we'll have to uh, call your parents up and – let them run premiere for me for a little bit after you guys score a bunch of goals. But Zev, I want to, <laughs> I want to thank you for taking the time to have this interview with me. Once again, welcome to the Richmond kickers. We can't wait to get you here in Virginia and start training again. And uh, really looking forward to what you do on the field this year. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to meeting everyone else as well. Thanks again. Kicking it.